The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for taking your time this evening uh, to talk about this very, very important subject. I'm very excited to have uh, Tim Twig with us tonight. I, I want to thank him just on the right out of the gate to take your time. I know you're an extremely busy man. Uh, this is a subject that we've all been struggling with. I spent the last day and a half really looking at some of the laws and all the changes, and I watched, uh, Tim, your, your webinar a week ago, and I think things have, have, have changed since then. So uh, hopefully we're going to get some of those updates. I'm Dr. Guy Yetro from Dental Sleep Solutions and DS3, and we're going to spend the next hour talking about the HR perspectives and considerations and requirements of this coronavirus, COVID-19. And we have with us an expert. I mean, I am thrilled that I got introduced to, you, to Tim. I'm going to be calling you for my personal business uh, very shortly as well. A good friend of mine introduced us. Tim Twig is the president and co-owner of Bent Erickson and Associates, uh, one of the leading human resources and personnel managers in the healthcare industry. Been doing this over 35 years. And my understanding is you treat, uh, not treat, uh, the dentists coming out of me. Your clients are primarily dentists. So a big, big, large portion of them all are. And uh, talking to, to friends of mine that use you, uh, you know, you have someone you can, at a time like this, it's important to have someone you can call. What do I do? And uh, have an organization that, that just, what, what do you do? You just help with the HR needs of, of these dental practices uh, as an ongoing uh, consultant, correct? Correct. Right. Yeah, human resource and employment compliance. That's our specialty and our focus. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I've got a whole list of all his accolades. Here's the publisher and currently co authors the column of dental economics called Staff Issues. He's part of the management faculty of the Speakers Bureau and the business affiliate for a Seattle Study Club. He's even on the, uh, as being an ADA consultant for the ADA's Council of Dental Practice. I think we've got a extremely qualified person here. Uh, a little housekeeping. I'm going to be quiet. I know that's hard for some of you who know me uh, to, to believe, but I am because we've got the expert here, Tim. And he's going to talk for, oh, I don't know, the majority of this hour here. And then we're going to get to your questions. We had over 600 people sign up for this tonight. So we can't open your mics. Put your questions in the question box, not the chat box, in the question box. And at the end, we'll reserve some time. We'll, we'll see what the common questions are and we'll address those. And if you want CE, you're going to get CE. You got to check with your state boards whether it's, uh, uh, valid for for this type of a course, but you'll get that within your uh, in your in your email box within 24 hours to the email that you signed up with. So without further ado, uh, Tim, take it away. Thank you so much. I really really appreciate you taking your time out to help us all manage all these decisions. Great, and you're welcome. And and thanks so much for the opportunity. So as Dr. Yatra said, we're just going to cook through a bunch of content here. I just know that. Uh, it may help answer a number of the questions. And then like he indicated, we'll just turn this open to some Q&A and uh, see what we can do about helping everyone out. Um, as he indicated, the uh, title is just Minding Your HR P's and Q's. And we, we're gonna talk about sort of an update as it relates to HR. So about 10 days ago, the First Family Corona's Response Act, Coronavirus Response Act, commonly referred to as HR 6210, passed. And relative to that, to ensure compliance with it. It applies to every single employer who has less than 500 employees. I know the ADA has 
submitted for some exemptions. None of those exemptions have come true. If some of you have looked at the federal government's FAQs, particularly, it gets thrown around a whole lot on social Make sure it's not on his tablet. What's that? Sorry, I thought I was muted. We were having internet problems here. I was yelling down at my family okay. to get off the internet. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, relative to possible exemptions, uh, questions 58 and 59, what the government says, if you have less than 50 and complying with this would be an undue hardship and it would lead to you ceasing operations, then you can be exempt. But of course, to do that, you're going to have to fill out a form, you're going to have to send it in, and they haven't even done the form yet, much less given a timetable or the exact criteria for what, how they're going to apply these exemptions. And so for right now, as much as you might want to wish and pray and hope that there's an exemption, there isn't one right now. Now, there are two main parts to be mindful of with this. There's a sick leave part, there's a family leave part. And please understand, and you're going to hear me say this multiple times tonight, there's very specific, very strict, and limited qualification criteria. Please understand that for this sick leave and family leave, it's not if you just get the sniffles. It's not if you get a cold. It's not if you're just not feeling well. It's not if you have some other flu bug. It is very specific strict and limited in terms of people qualifying. Here are the six qualifications. I've broken them apart and you'll learn why we separate one, two, and three from four, five, and six. Note that in one, two, and three, it's the employee individually who is being affected because of a state, federal, or local quarantine, or to self-quarantine by a healthcare provider, et cetera. Also, please understand that given your state and any mandates or orders you have to close, to not see people, any kind of shelter in place, these things do not qualify as a quarantine. So not working, closed down does not affect this criteria at all. And then you can see four, five, and six are more about the employee caring for someone else who is subject to some of these provisions here. So one, two, and three deal with the employee, him or herself individually, four, five, and six involve where this employee might be involved in the care of someone. Now, you look at number six, and number six is our government's way of just creating some big catch-all something or other to who knows what. Employees experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by Health and Human Services in conjunction with the Department of the Treasury and the Department of Labor, well, they haven't even defined any of this stuff. And so for right now, you don't even have to worry about number six because even the government is clueless as to what they really meant by trying to create some big catch-all bucket. In terms of qualifying, all six of these act as qualifying reasons for a person being eligible for sick leave. Eligibility for the family leave part is limited to only number five. So this is not, and across the board again, it's not about someone having a cold or some other flu. It is specific to these six. All six apply for sick leave and only number five for family leave. Then the question is, well, how much is a person paid when they're on leave? If they are qualifying under one, two, and three, they are to be paid their normal wages or up to a max of $511 per day. So normal wages maxed or capped at 511. If it's four, five, and six, they are to receive two thirds of what their normal wage is up to a max of $200.
Next is, well, how much time is someone potentially eligible for under this in sick leave if they qualify for one through six? It can be up to 80 hours if this person works full time and full time defined by the government is 40 hours per week. If they work less than 40 hours per week, then that 80 hours is prorated based on the number of hours they typically work in a week. On the family leave side, they can be provided with up to 12 weeks of leave. And again, that's based on 40 hours per week. If they work less than that, again, this is prorated in terms of the number of hours. Important to know on the sick leave part, there is no carryover. The 80 hours is there for the specific use of those specific qualifying reasons. If that's not used, it is not banked, it can't be carried over in any way, shape, or form. On the family leave side, the first two weeks are unpaid. So while someone can be granted up to 12 weeks, the first two weeks, there's no pay at all. The following 10 weeks after that is where that two thirds of their wages up to $200 a day comes into play. There is also built into the family leave some job protection exemptions that are possible for employers who have less than 25 employees. So typically in a family leave situation, you must bring the person back. You are absolutely required to, in a sense, hold their job for them to come back to. In this case, the government has carved out some possible exemptions for employers with 25 employees or less. A couple of footnotes on this. You cannot use, or an employee cannot use the sick and family leave concurrently with other benefits. So if this employee with you has some accrued and unused vacation or PTO, they do not get to use that at the same time as they are benefiting from the sick leave and family leave. So basically no double dipping. You cannot force an employee to use other benefits first. Any other accrued and unused benefits, they can keep, in a sense, keep them banked and go ahead and take advantage of this sick leave and family leave again if they qualify. They cannot get this and unemployment at the same time. So again, no double dipping. They can use the sick leave and the family leave portions of this concurrently, because if you think back to what I said a couple minutes ago, with family leave, the first two weeks are unpaid. And so the thinking is, well, if someone applies for sick leave and that gives them 80 hours or effectively two weeks, then they can transition to family leave and the payment part of family leave picks up at that, although it may be a reduced amount. If you provide medical insurance to your employees, you must continue that if someone is out on this leave and you can't have this employee uh, required to replace you can't take adverse action against this person. If they qualify under one of these six, you can't just terminate them or otherwise take adverse action. There's a posting requirement. There's a poster as of tomorrow that all of you are supposed to have posted in your workplace. And again, I just want to reiterate that the qualification for this sick leave family leave only applies to the criteria one through six, a lack of work, a closure, whether it's mandated by your state, whether it is recommended by the ADA, does not qualify for this. Only criteria one through six. You've all probably heard and read about there is a tax credit or reimbursement for any wages that you pay under this sick leave and family leave. And the way you get your money back is you can deduct it off of your normal tax deposit that you make. And so it's just a dollar for dollar, basically reimbursement for that. All that happens is you're having to sort of front the money 
until you do payroll and otherwise would be paying a tax deposit. If it turns out that your tax deposit you're making is not big enough for you to be made whole or reimbursed for anything you've paid, then you are going to be able to fill out a form, send it in, get a credit, and the IRS is going to cut you a check. The forms haven't been made yet, the forms haven't been provided to anyone, but that's the way it's set up to work. It's also important in this for you to ensure that you get the reimbursement, you've got to have the documentation. And among the documentation is if you're paying compensation under the family leave portion to an employee because they're staying home to take care of their kids, because their schools or their childcare facilities are closed, some of the documentation is the email announcement or a picture of the sign that was on the door of the school indicating that it was closed. You're going to have to ensure documentation to ensure that you get reimbursed. Some of the considerations in this are what can you do to set yourself up for a strong opening? I know that you're being kind of hammered by this whole thing of closures and only emergencies and a lack of supplies, whether it be masks and so on. And so rather than spend a whole lot of time lamenting that, because it is what it is, how can we set ourselves up for a strong reopening? Well, there can be people that you still employ who are calling and rescheduling people to ensure you have a full schedule when you come back or calling and scheduling past due recall. Maybe it's doing a deep dive on chart audits where you're calling people where you've diagnosed treatment and it just hasn't been completed yet. Also helping ensure that you're gonna have a full schedule. What about cleaning up some of the old insurance that's sitting around, an insurance form that got kicked back because something wasn't right on the form? There can be deep cleaning of shelves and drawers and cupboards or inventorying your supplies and getting rid of the stuff that's old and expired. What about making sure your medical equipment, your uh, defibrillators, your fire extinguishers are all extinguishers are all up to date and current, including correct uh, and current patient lists. Maybe deactivating those people who haven't been seen for the last seven to ten years and are otherwise consuming time in some of the marketing that you might otherwise do, and the likelihood of them ever resurfacing or showing is pretty low. You can paint, you can remodel, you can incorporate new technology, you can work on training with your team to enhance expertise. So when you reopen, again, it's a strong reopening. And of course, in their CE, and whether it's through uh, sleep medicine CE or it's through other types of virtual learning that is available to you, it's like, here is a way of saying, okay, this is crappy and we don't like this, but maybe we can you know, make a little progress on some of these fronts. There is also the ability to do what's called a different capacity work rate. So for some of the things that I've listed up there, if these duties are not the duties that the employee typically does, so painting and remodeling, for example, or maybe the hygienist who is calling people to come in for past due recall, you don't have to compensate them at the same rate of pay that you compensate them when you're otherwise seeing patients or they're otherwise doing their normal duties and responsibilities. You can pay them a different rate of pay. It just has to be at least minimum wage, but otherwise you and the employee can decide and it might be a win-win for you, a win-win for the employee. In setting yourself up for a strong opening, there's things about well, what about a skeleton crew? Or what about people who can work at home and access our computer to do some of these deep dives that we talked about or calling people and scheduling people? You gotta look at this issue of reducing hours potentially for some people or maybe for everyone. 
And it may turn out that for some people, there are no hours at all. And depending upon <coughs> your circumstance and situation, it may be that there are no hours for everyone for some window of time. If there's no hours or for some or all, then what gets introduced is this idea of, <coughs> well, is this a furlough? Is this a layoff? Or is this a termination? Now, relative to that, just understand from an HR perspective, furloughs, temporary layoffs, and just reduced hours all land in the same bucket. A permanent layoff and a termination land in another bucket. Does the employment relationship end? Well, in a furlough, temporary layoff, or reduced hours, no, it doesn't. The employee, they may not have any hours or they have reduced hours. In a permanent layoff or termination, yes, the employment relationship is ended. <clears throat> Do you have to pay out unpaid wages? Kind of a final aid check. Well, if they have continuing hours under a furlough, temporary layoff, or reduced hours, then no, you don't have to give them a final paycheck. You just continue to pay them at whatever your regular pay interval is. If they have no hours, or if hours are unknown because you just have them on call, then yes, you need to pay them their any unpaid wages at that point in time. Obviously, if it's a permanent layoff or termination, yes, you got to give them a final paycheck. Pay out of accrued and unused sick leave, if applicable. It's discretionary if they have continuing hours. Yes, you need to pay it out again if there's no hours or unknown hours. Some states have state mandates that can even override the part about it being discretionary. Yep, you got to pay it out. Same thing for accrued and unused vacation and PTO. Paper at the end, if it's furlough, temporary off, reduce hours, a letter can suffice. If it's a permanent, <coughs> excuse me, if it's permanent layoff or termination, a letter and or all of the appropriate termination paperwork does need to be taken care of. Paperwork upon return. Well, if it's, again, furlough, layoff, reduced hours, no, because they've been your employee all along, there is really no need for any paperwork. If it's termination or permanent layoff, yes, because for all intents and purposes, they are a new hire, a new employee, which then raises the thing about what about reinstatement of benefits, <clears throat> not applicable in category one, but in category two, it is discretionary, although again, some states mandate that if you bring someone back within a certain number of months of laying them off, then you must reinstate them at the same pay and with the same benefits that they had before. Now, as you'll note in here, there have been several times when I've talked about state mandated. And part of that is recognizing that states do differ and it's also recognizing that in talking to you tonight, I'm talking to practices all over the United States, and I can't in this time period like bust it down to every single state because we'd be sitting here for about six hours. Eligibility under the sick leave portion of this new law, if someone is employed after April 1st, well, if the business is closed, no. If there are no hours, no, the person is not eligible. If the business is open and the employee is still working after April 1st, then yes, this person would be eligible again if they met one of those six criteria. <clears throat> Over on the permanent and termination side, no. If they were laid off prior to April 1st, if you do reinstate someone, bring someone back, well, then clearly they're going to be eligible from whenever you bring them back and till the end of the year while this law is still in effect. And the same thing applies for the family leave portion under human error HR 6201. The opening scenarios. 
you're either going to reopen in a phase, kind of incremental spooling up sort of thing, or you're not going to phase it. You're just going to throw the switch. And some of this depends on how well you set yourself up for a reopening. Regardless of that, there are just some things to bear in mind. It's got to be a coordinated effort because you've got to coordinate between whatever state and local mandates may still exist. You've got to coordinate with team members as far as availability and coming back and your workload when you open. You've got to coordinate with your suppliers to make sure you've got everything you need to have to truly be open and meet CDC and OSHA guidelines for masks and other types of supplies that you're going to need. And of course, you've got to have patients who are willing to come in. Just understand that patients might be nervous, they might be fearful, especially if you've got a patient base that's comprised of a lot of people who land in sort of that high risk category. 60 or 65 and older. So there may need to be some reassuring people about your care, your infection control, your safety standards that you are committed to and that you employ. Last Friday, the second of the big pieces of legislation was signed. It's commonly called, or the name of it is, the CARES Act. So the ink is still drying on this. This legislation is 880 pages long. So at this point, I can give you some of the main provisions and main components of it. One of the main provisions is that it allows for grants. Each grant is $10,000. The grants are going to be issued, so to speak, on a first come and first serve basis. They allocated $10 billion for these grants, which you do the math, that means there's a million businesses that can get one of these $10,000 grants. These grants are going to be done in conjunction with an SBA loan. They're not standalone. You can start the paperwork right now for the grant. You cannot yet start the paperwork for the SBA loans, <clears throat> at least at this juncture, because they haven't even got everything out to banks for banks to understand how the process is even going to work. Once it gets going, According to the legislation, there will be two types of loans that you could apply for. The first one, EIDL, is Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And the second one is PPP for Payroll Protection Program. Most of you, it will probably be more the PPP type loan rather than the EIDL. Um, but again, this is going to be better determined by your banker, your financial advisors, and your accountant. These are going to be SBA loans. They will be federally backed. And of course, the part that everyone is kind of excited about is all or part of these loans may be forgiven. And so what gets people excited is the thought that, woohoo, maybe we're going to get a bunch of free money. Now, when it comes to the free money, just know that one of the qualifications is the, re the loan request is necessary to support ongoing operations. This isn't for you to be able to buy a new car. It's not for you to be able to remodel. It's to support ongoing operations and specifically the proceeds will be used to retain workers and maintain payroll. In addition to paying a mortgage or a lease payment on your building, not your house, and making utility payments for your practice. So there are certainly some strings attached to this. The loans can be up to two and a half times your average monthly payroll. So if your monthly payroll runs $30,000, 
then two and a half times that is 75,000. That's the max of the loan. It's two and a, it's maxed out at two and a half times what your average monthly payroll is. The forgiving part is if that money is used again for payrolls and due to the crisis and or restoring payrolls moving forward. That's the forgiven part along with leases and utility payments. <clears throat> if you reduce your payroll by reducing people or reducing wages such that your payroll is overall reduced by more than 25%, then the forgiveness piece is not going to be happening. And so as a result of that, everyone is now going, whoa, maybe I should go bring my people back and restore wages because otherwise, A, you're probably not gonna qualify for a loan, and B, the proceeds from the loan are not going to be forgiven. A thing that was driving me crazy over the last two weeks is when things first started with this, there were a whole bunch of people throwing around all this stuff of, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, lay everyone off, lay everyone off, quick, hurry, lay everyone off. And then as soon as this got passed, everyone read it, and then they start saying, oh my gosh, bring everyone back, bring everyone back. And all they're doing is treating employees like crap. And so I think it becomes um, more meaningful and more valid to spend some time and really Think about what is the circumstance and situation that you face in your state, again, with mandates and closures and being open and being closed, and the opportunities that you have. I'm going to talk about that a little more in just a minute. Even if you have reduced staff and therefore wages at some point, they are giving you a period of time to restore the workforce and the wages. And they're giving you up till June 20th. So again, this is not something that you have to rush right out tomorrow and try to do. First of all, you can't even apply for one of these loans yet through the banks. And second of all, you do have clearly a window of time to get things back in gear and going and still qualify for the forgiveness part of this loan. In terms of payroll, since that becomes sort of the guiding triggering factor, it's important to know that it obviously it includes salaries and wages. It includes anything you otherwise might be paying for vacation and medical and sick leave. <clears throat> It allows for you to throw in, again, provisions of group health if you provide it, as well as any state and local taxes. So the monies you pay in for your state uh, unemployment tax, or if there's metro taxes or transit taxes, those get counted in as payroll costs, which means you would get those costs that you have paid forgiven in the loan. It's also important to note of the things that are not included. So federal payroll taxes are not included. See our federal government, they do want their money. And for those of you where you make more than $100,000 a year, anything over $100,000 on an annualized basis is not going to be forgiven. Only the first 100,000 is. And look at the very bottom of that. If someone qualifies under sick leave or family leave under HR 6201, you don't get credit for that because they've already built in the way for you to get credit for that by simply not paying that on your federal deposit. They're just not gonna allow you to double dip and be paying the sick leave and family wages, and then also have that forgiven on payroll. Again, 
best resources for this as this starts to play out. Obviously, your accountant, your banker, financial planner, advisor, consultant, to do some analysis. It's almost like some cash flow analysis and pros and cons of what makes the most sense. One other major provision of the CARES Act, and it's the one that probably is sparking the most controversy, is the unemployment provision. It's like this unemployment freak out. So let's talk about unemployment in general so we all norm about making sure that we understand what it is and basically how it works. Unemployment is designed to partially replace an employee's wages. States, every state has its own formula to calculate how much an individual will get. Some use annual earnings, some use prior quarters, some use the highest quarter in the last 12 months. They all use some kind of formula and calculation. The end result is unemployment benefits for an employee end up at plus or minus about half of what they otherwise earned. Each state also has a cap on it. So regardless of how much you earn, there is a cap of what that total weekly benefit could ever be. There's typically a one to two week waiting period, and there's typically about a one to three week processing time for this to work. A lot of states are waiving the waiting period, but there is still this processing time. And given the sheer numbers of people who are showing up at unemployment agencies right now, the processing time is being lengthened. Normally, benefits run for about 26 weeks. Under the CARES Act, they've extended it to 39 weeks. Please understand unemployment taxes or unemployment benefits are taxable. Sometimes running around on social media and people go crazy, oh my gosh, they're free money and it's not even taxed. No, unemployment benefits are taxed. The most controversial aspect of the unemployment part of the CARES Act is this, what I'm calling a $600 kicker that has been built into the legislation. And basically what the federal government says is states will do their calculation to determine how much a person's going to get on unemployment. And then after the state does their calculation, the feds are going to kick in $600 in addition to whatever the state came up with. Now, obviously some of you who know about this or have given some thought to it, you've already gone down this path of going, oh my gosh, this might mean an employee is actually going to make more money with their benefits plus this $600 kicker than they were making when they were working for me. Who's ever going to come back to work for me? Or it's almost like people are incentivized to stay out on unemployment. I will show you how that does play out, and it can be a potential reality. Let's just say here are some different weekly wages for an employee. Typically, unemployment is going to give them about half of what they otherwise earn again, up to whatever the cap is for that given state. If you add the $600 kicker to the typical benefit, you can see now what someone might be getting on a weekly basis, and so you don't have to do the math. There's the difference. So if someone was potentially making $400 a week, they might now be actually making $800 a week or realizing $800 a week, which is a $400 increase in what they were making before. You can see that the thing starts to even out when you get up to an average weekly wage of around $1,200, which is around $50,000 a year. So clearly you have a lot of employees who are under that and this is going to create some interesting dynamics to play out. I will also tell you that for a person to continue qualifying for unemployment, they have to A, 
not be working, but they also have to not have been offered a job. So if this person is able to work, if the person is offered an employment, and the person turns it down because of this little game right here, the person at that point runs the risk of losing all of their unemployment benefits. So there is a little bit of a, of a carrot stick thing that is in place here that is designed to help ensure that people get back to work. Lastly, again, documentation. This idea of you showing your payroll costs, the idea of this being used in the calculation, your rent or your lease, your utility bills, you're gonna have to have all of this as part of the applying for a loan process. So it's right now, while you have maybe some time on your hands, if you're gonna go down this path, it's a matter of starting to collect all the parts and pieces you're going to need. So what do you do? You analyze the pros and cons of grants and loans. You know, there's gonna be some hoops with this that you're gonna have to jump. There's gonna be some criteria that you're going to have to meet. It's gonna take a certain amount of time. Again, there's gonna be some strings attached to it. And you have to go, okay, well, is this worth it? The idea in my example of getting a loan of $75,000 and not ever having to pay it back is a pretty cool thing. But then you have to go, okay, hoops, criteria, time, strings, I'm mandated to be closed anyway. How can I really do this and bring people back and, and make this work? So it's not necessarily a no brainer approach in this. You got to analyze your staffing needs. Some of this is based on what is your plan for your reopening? Again, this phased reopening, or are you just going to throw the switch? Some ideas of how you're going to rebuild and the strategies for that. Build up your cash reserves. That's not so much right now. That's for next time. Some of you got aware, I got caught unawares, regardless of um Susie Orman and regardless of all the other financial gurus saying you're supposed to have three to six months of uh emergency reserves you haven't had those things and it's been causing some stress understandably so look at credit lines even if you have a credit line that you never use but you simply have to pay 75 or 100 dollars a year just to keep it open it might be worth it just in terms of lowering stress levels if something like this were to come up again. And for some of you from a policy and benefit standpoint, if you don't have a policy manual, you don't have an employee handbook, if you don't have things clearly defined or current and up to date given your state and federal compliance thing, well, this maybe this is the whack on the side of the head for you to clarify those policies and those benefits. Some of you, if you've been feeling whipsawed in this, um, had you had all of this stuff better defined and clarified, you could have approached this potentially with more confidence and again, less stress. So there's my real fast run through with it. Here's contact information. You can certainly email us uh, there is a link to our website where we specifically have a page that is going through a whole bunch of what ifs, <clears throat> a whole bunch of FAQs. I mentioned earlier the need for this poster that you're supposed to be posting. There's a link to the website for that so that you can just <clears throat> download it, print it out, and scotch tape it to the wall. So I'm going to have Dr. Yatros, yes. um, just, why don't you comment if you want about this and the other slide and then we'll bring the contact stuff back and we'll turn it over to Q&A. Does that work? Yeah, it does. I've just had a little bit of technical difficulty. I think it's my internet connection here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. I turned off my camera. Uh, I'm not as good looking as you anyway, so uh, I think that, that helped uh, helped a little bit. So I, there's some questions posted here, and uh, I, I leave yours up there for a few moments before we get to that. 
I think, uh, you know, um, one of them is, you know, how do we get a hold of you? Can we have a copy of these slides? Uh, I'll first mention we will post this on our YouTube page, the recording, and hopefully uh, it, it comes through pretty well. I was having a few audio problems, but uh, even with that, it would be very good. I think it records it on the main server anyway. So that's at dentalsleepsolutions.com YouTube page. Uh, and then they're asking uh, relative, if, relative to your question about the slides. Yeah. I will send you a copy of the slides and then All you right. can just shoot those out to everyone. Sure. Then we can include them. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, this is a good opportunity. If you have other questions, I know that that's what you do there. So uh, I, uh, Mark Murphy's who referred me to you and he uses you. And, you know, I think it's a good opportunity if you're looking for okay. HR solutions. The, I, I'm assuming you don't mind if they reach out to you directly. For, for HR purposes for the dental practices in the future as well. Not not at all. All right, so uh, we'll be glad to help. keep keep it in mind. You're obviously a very well well uh, informed individual, and this has been fantastic. Um, do you want me to read you these? Uh, there's a few questions here. I think with the getting the slides is going to solve a lot of it. Pointing people to our YouTube sure. page uh, was was one of it. Uh, I had a personal question because uh, I was researching this today, and I think you cleared it up but with that EIDL and the PPP. You can apply for the EIDL now and then go ahead and get the PPP rolled into one in the future if it makes sense. Is that is that a true statement? Yes, that's true. Okay, very good. Well, I thought um, you, you have I to take, take care of my of own us. question first. So, <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll have to take, um, you, you will, when you go for the PPP, you will have to redo some of the stuff. But yeah, you can at least get the ball rolling right now. Very well. And so um, I think some of the questions on here, uh, if, do you want me to read? Do you, do you want me to just read some or do you, can you see them yourself? How would you prefer? No, read them up. Okay. So you already answered where to get the, uh, the, the uh, poster. If one parent is at home and a two parent home, can the second parent be off too? I'm not sure if I totally understand. I think she's talking about. Um, well, yeah. I'm assuming that if, if you've got, let's just say, husband, wife, Let's say the wife works for the dental practice. Uh, the, they, they've got kids. Kids are, I mean, the schools are closed. The husband's staying home with them. Can the wife qualify? That's a really great question. And actually, we haven't been asked that. And so I'll find the answer to that one, and I'll shoot it to you, and you can get it out to, to okay. either the group or to whoever submitted it. Uh, very well. So uh, we'll make a note who asked that. We'll, we'll get that to you. Uh, sec uh, if your employees are placed under unemployment, then I'm assuming to avoid double dipping, then the FFCRA doesn't apply. I think you addressed that one already, didn't you? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. true. But I will also say this. One of the misnomers about unemployment is this thinking that it's all or nothing, but it's right. not. A person could be on un unemployment and you could still have this person working for you either on an on-call basis or some reduced hours. And the state just factors that in and this person gets what's commonly referred to as partial benefits as opposed to getting full benefits. But to the question specifically, yeah, you don't get to uh, tap in to leave under um, HR 6201 and get unemployment at the same time. Okay, very well. Um, can you require your team to do CE if they've been furloughed? I, I don't know that that's in the scope of all this, but that's a question I, I, I they're, if they're furloughed, they're not officially employed. So what's the answer to that? Correct, correct. Yeah, so I would think think the answer is not. And I if do you're, think if you're going to require them, if you're going to require them to do that, then you, in a sense, you've taken them off furlough and they're now working for you. And then you can certainly ask or request it, but you're going to have to pay for the time, of course, because that's considered work time. Yeah. Uh, yeah there's a lot of questions you've answered. Uh, if you're furlough. If you furlough and when you come back, the income is not going to be the same paychecks, well, you will have to be adjusted accordingly. How do you pay the same paycheck as before? Did I read that correctly? Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand it. Um, if, if I was paying someone $25 an hour and then I furloughed them and when they come back, obviously I can bring them back at $25 an hour. 
if circumstances dictated and I wanted to negotiate a different rate of pay and say, hey, I, I, I'd like you to come back, but I can't afford 25, would you work for 22 or something? Well, that's just a negotiation that, right. that you do with the employee and, and see if you can have that work out. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I think this is a, I, I think I understand this one and uh, I don't know the answer, so I'll ask you here. Are furloughed, <laughs> uh, I've been reading this stuff for two days myself. Uh, God love you for doing what you do, by the way. Uh, you know, I, the, everybody finds their place in life. I guess you might not look like looking at people's teeth, but uh, I'd much rather look at teeth than uh, read this stuff. Uh, conversely, are furloughed employees entitled to all their un unused sick and vacation time? Some are still working part time. Most are not. I think you somewhat addressed that, but I maybe was having audio problems when you were. So I'm interested. Um, yeah. So part of this depends on the state that you're in. If you're in California, California requires the payout of any accrued and unused sick leave and PTO and vacation. If the reduced hours or the furloughing crosses over into a new pay period. So it gets kind of tricky by each state. Um, in general, for a lot of states, you can furlough, and if people are going to have continuing hours, you do not have to pay out those accrued and unused um, days or hours. It becomes discretionary. But again, some states will step in and have some mandates with that. Great, that's, that's, that's a uh, good answer. I appreciate you clarifying that. A couple more here, uh, if you don't mind. This one's a, a good question, I think. Uh, I think you have the answer, but I want to make sure. Where do I find the right website for the CARES Act grant? Is it on your uh, a Frequently Asked Questions website? Is that a, or where do they find, where do they want to go fill out that? Well, we have, some, we have some information on there. Uh, we're, at, we're in the process of adding more, but the best sources, as I said earlier, are your accountant, are your banker, your financial advisor, unless you were crazy and had nothing better to do with your life and you just wanted to take a copy of the 880 pages and start working your way through it. Okay. Uh, a couple more here. Does uh, unemployment uh, plan on bringing back your staff except for one person? Would this be considered maintain, uh, maintaining payroll? Is there a certain start date? Um, well, the reestablishing of your staffing levels and payroll, again, your little magic date for that is June 30th. And basically, they look at a percentage. And right now, the percentage that's being played with is 25%. So if you've reduced staff or you've reduced wages below or more so than 25%, you would potentially lose the forgiveness provisions of the loan. If you restore the staffing levels and the wages so that while they may be a little bit lower, but they're not more than 25% lower, then the forgiveness provisions would still be valid. Okay. And what, I think the next question leads into that. What salary, what are they looking for? What is their baseline? Uh, is it salary since February 15th? Is it last year's? So what is, where are the, where's the baseline coming from? Um, no, it is uh, February 15th. And uh, depending upon the bank and their loans, they may look for, you know, your tax returns for the last couple of years. They may look for financial statements for the last year so that they can track this and be able to truly get an accurate reflection of what your payroll costs have been running. So they'll look back it's gonna, beyond. It's going to vary a little bit from bank to bank. Okay. Uh, and then the question, if I make over 100K, can I use the forgiveness loan for May for June for myself? And then the second part of that is you can will I... be able to use the forgiveness piece for up Two. to the 100,000. Anything over 100,000, is not going to be part of the forgiveness. Okay. Uh, I'll see a few more and we're going to finish on time here. Can 
I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it because it's a, a good question. I think people will be asking, can PPP loan be used for owner income? Yes, again, up to 100000 Well, it can be used for it, but the forgiveness part is just the first 100000 Okay, even if you're the owner? Okay. If you're the owner and as the owner, you're an employee of the business and you draw income in the form of W-2 income, sure. Great. Uh, can a person coming for temporary coverage qualify for EPSL and FMLA? I think we'll end with that. In um, closing statements. Yes. Yes, it doesn't matter. It's not an issue. Qualification for the sick leave, family leave portion of the HR 6201, qualification is not based on any number of hours. Like if you work more than this, you qualify. If you work less, you don't. Anyone who works can qualify. Then it just becomes a matter of how much, what is the compensation that they're receiving and how many hours are they being provided in this. Okay. Well, there's still a few other questions. I think we could be on here until uh, this time tomorrow because uh, they just keep coming in. It's a, how many pages did you say it was? 800? Some of that? Uh... 880. Did you read it all? <laughs> Uh, no, we focus primarily on the parts that are, again, HR related. So the unemployment pieces, the loan and the forgiveness pieces, but a whole bunch of it has to do with bailing out airlines and okay. a bunch of money to hospitals and research labs and all that. So okay. no, we didn't spend time reading that part. Well, if you need more specific questions, don't hesitate to 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 talk to Tim and his company, Bent Erickson and Associates. Uh, out in Oregon, a long way from here. I, I just, I, I'm just so impressed with what you know. I've some of the questions are coming through and texts from people that I know are just like, wow, this guy knows his stuff. I uh, thank Mark Murphy for introducing us. I'm really, uh, really pleased that, that you could do this. I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, for those of you who uh, have more questions, uh, there's uh, Tim's contact information. Then you can hit the next slide. Uh, we will be doing back to some CE uh, after this. We've had a couple of COVID-19 courses, but I think this is a good opportunity. We're ramping up a lot of our CE for everyone out there. I think while you're at home, uh, what, some of the things you said, I think I, uh, we, we, we really ought to listen to. Let's get ready for when this is over to where we can hit the, 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 the track running. And if you're not doing enough dental sleep in your practice, uh, this next one's talking about why you should be, and that'll be on April 14th, and it's at a regular time at 8. That's what we usually schedule these, and here's how you can get a hold of us if you, if you need. Uh, this will be, I think hit it one more time maybe, and it'll pop up the, it might have an animation on there or something, but uh, if not, uh, oh, something, somehow it got erased. There, there you go, maybe one more time, and there's our information. Okay, uh, this will be, again, on Dental Sleep Solutions. Go to YouTube, Dental Sleep Solutions. It'll be on there. We'll try to get anyone who needs the handouts. We'll try just to send it out with the CE, with just a PDF of the of the slides. I really appreciate you providing that information. It's fantastic, uh, and uh, thank you again for for taking your time. Thanks to everyone. We had a huge group on here tonight. One of the biggest webinars we've had in a long time. So I'm sorry if anybody had audio problems. I think part of it is uh, everybody in the whole country is on their internet right now, and we're you know all <laughs> on these go to meetings and go to webinars, and typically don't have that many problems, but. Uh, I think we're all draining this, putting the strain on the system. Um, anything, uh, any closing remarks you'd like to have, Tim? And we'll let everybody go. Uh, no, just thanks anything. again for the opportunity. I hope the information helps. And again, uh, folks feel comfortable to reach out and we'll do the best we can to both answer your questions and support you. I don't doubt that you will. Thank you so much for your time again. And uh, thank you everyone. If you have more questions about dental sleep things, uh, contact us clarification on on these things we'll try to help as well and everybody stay safe uh i know it's tough out there right now and uh we we will get through all this together if we can do anything to help let us know have a great evening thanks a lot again tim good night thank you and good night